Good morning and welcome to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we gather for worship on the first Sunday of the new year and the second Sunday after Christmas. We continue to celebrate the birth of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ and today we take a rare glimpse into the only account in the New Testament of Jesus as a boy becoming a young man. We're glad that you've joined us. May the Lord bless our worship together today. Let's begin. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As the called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have poured into our hearts the true light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light may shine forth in our lives through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from 1 Kings chapter 3. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on the throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, now I do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon woke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
epistle lesson is from Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The child Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. we profess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. 
I believed in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Happy New Year. In today's Gospel lesson from Luke, we learn the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This leads us to Jesus, 12-year-old boy in the temple at the Feast of the Passover. So I got to thinking, how can I weave together a personal story from this account of a 12-year-old boy Jesus at the Feast of the Passover and his time in the temple. Well, this might be stretching it a bit, but I do have a 12-year-old grandson, Eddie. So I'm going to make a few comparisons here. The first was Jesus was at the Feast of the Passover. And Eddie now is in confirmation, and he's learning and growing through his studies in his class. And also, Jesus became somewhat distracted, but very interested in conversing with the temple teachers. Consequently, he didn't leave with his parents when he's supposed to. And upon seeing him again, his parents said, well, we've been searching for you. Where have you been? Jesus' reply to his parents after being found was, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Perhaps Jesus knew that's where he needed to be, but he also needed to show respect and obedience to his parents, and so he did leave with them. Eddie often is distracted, and, and he's reading, or he's find, found something curious along the way of throwing a walk, and he might get lost. And then his parents were saying, well, where is that Eddie? Where did he go? And upon finding Eddie again, he might reply the same thing. Why were you looking for me? That's just 12-year-old Eddie. And one of the things I found really neat was that Jesus' mother treasured up all these things in her heart. She was astonished by what she saw in her son what he was saying, what he was doing. He's 12. But she knew her son was Christ the Lord. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Let's pray. Lord, help us to increase in wisdom and stature like Jesus. Be with us all this new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Loved and precious children of God, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we celebrate the second Sunday after Christmas and we continue to celebrate the birth of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ on that first Christmas day. It seems like so many of the Sundays out of the year, we think of and remember Jesus as an adult man. We look at his public ministry, and we see Jesus, the healer, the rabbi, the teacher, and the Lord and master of the 12 apostles. Maybe that's one of the reasons we enjoy Christmas and its season so much. We get to look at Jesus as a baby. And we remember that Jesus also lived his human life from the very beginning, from infancy and a baby and a child growing up and as a young boy. Today, in our gospel lesson, we have the only recorded incident in the New Testament of Jesus as a boy. We get a rare glimpse of a young man entering Jewish adulthood in the life of Jesus. Luke wrote, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary, were faithful Jews and annually participated in the Passover festival in Jerusalem. Now, at about age 12, a boy's introduction to the commandment, or mitzvah in Hebrew, was considered complete and he would become a son of the commandment. Bar is the Hebrew word for son, mitzvah, the word for commandment. So we see Jesus in this passage as a young Jewish man, a typical Jewish boy undergoing the ritual have, marking the completion of his introduction to the commandment of God, and becoming a young Jewish man. Today, Jews call that a young boy's bar mitzvah, marking his becoming a son of the command. Luke tells us that after the Passover, Jesus remained in the temple courts, blending with the other young Jewish men around him, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. It wasn't at all unusual, particularly at the time of the Passover. The Jewish teachers and scribes would make themselves available in the temple courts, and they would discuss the law and the commandments and the word of God with one another, asking questions of those that were listening to them and responding to the questions that others had. Students of the law were invited to participate in that, taking their turn answering questions, taking their turn asking them as well. Jesus was taking part in this learning process as a son of the command. Luke reports for us, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Jesus remained so long in the temple courts 
dialoguing with the teachers, taking his turn asking and answering questions, that the family caravan with which he and his parents had come down from Nazareth to Jerusalem to attend the Passover had packed up and already begun their trip home. They left Jerusalem without him. At the end of that first day of travel, Joseph and Mary began looking in earnest for Jesus, probably not worrying too much about him during the day because he was now a, a young man and could safely hang out with the other young men on their way back. But when evening came and they didn't find him, they immediately returned to Jerusalem. Naturally, by the time they got back and found him, they wanted to know what he was doing, why he hadn't gone back with them. Jesus said, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Well, the short answer to that question is no. They didn't know, and they didn't understand. Luke tells us they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. Joseph and Mary were still growing in their understanding of the special young man they were called to raise and their role as the parents, the earthly parents of the Son of God. The phrase Jesus used, in my father's house, has another meaning as well. It can certainly mean that Jesus was in the temple courts and in his father's house there, but it can also refer to being about the father's work, carrying out the business of the father. Jesus was also saying, didn't you know that I must be about my father's work? Just a few chapters later in Luke, that same exact word for must be in my father's house is also used by Jesus, the adult teacher, to describe his saving mission for all the world. As a boy, Jesus said, I must be in my father's house or I must be about the work of my Father. Then in Luke 9, Jesus uses the same word, must, and said to his disciples, the Son of Man, who is about his Father's work, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. The Son must and is about the Father's work. The Father's work was the Son's mission, and Jesus embraced that already as a young man. He was coming into his own, understanding more and more fully the mission that the Father had given to him when he sent him into the world. For Jesus, being in his Father's house wasn't just a matter of where his physical body happened to be. In the temple of God in Jerusalem, in the temple courts, dialoguing about the word of God. For Jesus, being in his Father's house, was about embracing and fully completing the work the Father had given him to do, committing his heart and soul to the task, the singular and unique task that God had given Jesus to accomplish in this world. Because of Jesus' commitment to his Father's will, because Jesus fully obeyed, his Father's plan. Because Jesus lived in our place and died the death we deserve and rose again to give us new life in his name. 
and to seal for us the forgiveness of our sins and eternal salvation by his grace and work. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we now are released from our sin and freed and empowered to be about our Father's work for us. For us as disciples of Christ, children of the Heavenly Father, being in our Father's house is not simply a matter of where our body happens to be in worship together on Sunday morning, but it is about our heart and our mind, our body and soul being committed to accomplish the mission that God has given to us in this world. A saving mission as well, proclaiming the good news of God's love in Christ Jesus, the Savior of the world, living and breathing and acting as ambassadors for Christ proclaiming the good news of the Savior, inviting others to lay their sins at the foot of the cross and find the full and complete forgiveness of the Father in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Being in our Father's house is not only a matter of our body being in worship on Sunday morning and when we gather together to worship. But it is about our lives being in service to our Father by living in witness to others. It is a matter of using our unique gifts, wisdom, experience, relationships, opportunities to be about the Father's work. Thank God that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Father's work for us and for our salvation. May God so grant us his grace and strengthen our faith and embolden our hearts that following the footsteps of our Savior, we too, who are in our Father's house in the Word, may also be about our Father's work in the world. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life eternal. Amen.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, as you have in the past, so also in this new year, preserve your church on earth and look with kindness on your children called by your name to be your people and witness to the world. Grant to your children a love for your word and a delight in your mission of making disciples of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your Son diligently heard the word of God and grew in wisdom and stature submissive to his earthly parents, and always about your work and in your house. Keep the people of your church abiding in your house and attending to your work, eager to be found among your word and sacraments, and always sharing your divine love and mercy with others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, uphold and strengthen those who serve in the administration of our government, including our president, our governor, and all those who serve the public good in the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Grant them character, courage, and wisdom to do what is right in your eyes and what is best for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, give patience and endurance to all who are sick or in any need, including Richard Nolan, who will be undergoing prostate surgery on January 4th. Grant to him your divine peace and protection and bless him with a safe and smooth surgery and a swift and full recovery in the days and weeks ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Baby.